the Zoom. Hey, Rachel, can I get a screen sharing? Yep, I just switched it over for you. Thank you. All right, good afternoon, everyone. Um, today, we're going to talk a little bit about judging sheep. I'm going to try to cover the basics the best I can, uh, doing it um, here on the virtual platform. Uh, we're going to be using a combination of some, some slides and some pictures and some videos. I hope everyone's internet connection holds up through the videos um, that I'm going to show and that the audio comes through okay. I know sometimes we get a lot of people on here and uh, sometimes the audio can get a little jumpy or sometimes the video can get a little jumpy, but I hope it holds out for everyone today. All right, I'm gonna start our PowerPoint here. Hold on a second. Maybe. Share here in a second. Share the right one. There we go. All right. So we're going to start off with terminology because sometimes, uh, if you haven't judged a lot, that may be confusing. Um, so most of the time, when we're talking about sheep classes, we'll hear three different kinds of of labels or descriptions for the classes. The first one being market lamb. When we're judging market lambs, it can be a mix of both weathers, castrated male sheep, and ewe lambs or ewes. Uh, they're all going to be less than a year of age, um, and we're going to be judging those on the market characteristics. For our breeding classes, we usually be labeled either breeding ewes or weather dams. Uh, those are the two classifications. While they mean the same thing, they're all gonna be female sheep. They could be of different ages. We could have uh, ewe lambs being less than a year of age, or we may have yearling ewes. Sometimes we have a description of yearling ewes, which are ewes that are between uh, you know, 12 months old and 24 months old. Uh, and a possibility you could judge some older sheep than that, but most of the time we're gonna be judging either ewe lambs uh, or yearling ewes. When the class is labeled as a weather dam, it doesn't change what we're seeing in the class. It's just going to change our priorities. Uh, weather dams mean they're going, we're trying to produce uh, weather lambs uh, for production, uh, for probably for the show ring. And so we're just going to put some, change our emphasis when we get to our criteria, or our, our selection criteria we're going to be looking at. We're just going to change, put some more emphasis on things such as muscle um, over maybe uh, femininity um or size a little bit and we might put some more more emphasis on the muscling characteristics of those ewes than maybe if it's just calling a straight breeding ewe class so that's the only difference so breeding ewes and weather dams are be classed as the females it just changes the emphasis of what uh we're looking for uh in those classes a little bit when we're judging sheep it is very important that we use the right terminology to describe uh, the body part we are talking about. Um, in, in sheep, uh, there's a few that are specific uh, just to sheep, right? Uh, one of those would be the top of the back. We call this the rack. So from the top of the shoulder, the very back edge of the shoulder blade, going back to the loin, this portion over the top of the ribs, we're going to call that the rack. Uh, just like in all the rest of the species, the portion here we call the loin. Then we move back into the rump. So the rump is from the hook bones going back to the dock. So all the area of the pelvis, the dock, what we call the shortened uh, piece of the tail that is left on the back end of the animal. We call that the dock. Uh, we call it the leg. I don't want to uh, know. Sometimes people call it, you know, we get a little confused. We might call it the ham or the round. That'd be the improper term for when we're talking about sheep. We're going to call that the leg. Um, if we're in the front of the lamb, uh, you know, in cattle, we call this the brisket. Um, in hogs, we might be talking about the jowl up in here. But here in lambs, most of the time we refer to this as the breast. 
So the breast of the lamb is up here in the front, right? So if we hear a talk, term talking about breast, that's up here in the front. Um, so those are the ones that are in particular, that are specific um, to lambs. The rest of the terms are pretty much the same. You know, we're going to talk about the belly and the rib and the structural parts, the hock and the pastern and the hoof and the knee and the forearm. Those are consistent really across all of our uh, livestock judging species. Just these ones, the rack, the dock, make sure we have the leg and the breast are very particular uh, to when we're talking about market lambs or sheep in general, or judging sheep in general. It's very important that we become familiar with the different parts as we're judging sheep, because if we don't know, um, so when we, try, when we try to give reasons and we want to talk to somebody about trying to describe the animal, we want to make sure we're using the right terminology. And then we know uh, when we're talking about the loin, we know where the loin is, or when we're going to talk about handling a lamb here in a little bit, that we are handling the right portion of the animal uh, to determine the size of that loin. So we're gonna start with market lambs. I think market lambs are slightly easier uh, to judge than breeding ewes. Um, but we wanna always remember what we're looking for in the priorities. The number one priority when looking at market lambs is muscle. We're looking for the amount of meat we're gonna have in that carcass. That's what their purpose is to provide meat. Um, we're gonna be looking, I'm gonna show some pictures here in a minute, uh, but where we look for that muscle, but down the top of the animal, through the leg of the animal. Next is finish. Finish is the term that describes the amount of fat uh, that's on the external portion of uh, the animal between the, between the hide over, uh, over the muscle uh, of the animal. In market lambs, we want some finish. Finish is an important uh, product for making a good, uh, a tasty product when we, when we eat that meat. Uh, coming from the lamb, we want some fat. Also, when the lamb is being processed, it's hanging in the cooler for a day or two, that fat protects that muscle tissue, prevents it from dehydrating, from losing uh, water as it's hanging in the cooler before it is cut and packaged. Um, so we want some finish on lamb. We don't want lambs that have no finish and we don't want too much. So finding the right amount of finish or evaluating the lambs to find the right amount of finish is very important. And um, we're gonna talk specifically about finish here in just a minute. Next, pounds in volume. When we sell lambs, most of the time, we are getting paid on the weight of that lamb. Uh, you could have two lambs of equal finish and equal muscle, uh, but if one weighs 90 pounds and one weighs 135 pounds, the one that's 135 pounds is gonna outplace the lighter weight lamb because there's more total pounds of product in that animal. And coming along with pounds also comes the volume of the animal, looking at the size of the body, the width, the depth. Um, we're going to talk about that here in just a minute. And then finally, structure and balance. Structure, we want those animals to be able to walk. While it's not as important for structure as we're going to talk about in ewe lambs, they are still a reflection of the breeding stock. So we're judging market lambs. Uh, that is a reflection of what that breeding stock looked like. So if we're choosing poor structured market lambs, um, that's meaning there's probably problems back in our breeding flock and we don't want to select for those kind of animals. We don't want to put those animals up on the top end of the class. Uh, but minor structure faults are not as important or not as highly uh, critical to put down as in breeding sheep. And then finally balance, how that package is all put together. Um, and how the animal looks uh, also kind of comes in play, especially when we're talking about closer pairs of animals. We have two that are fairly similar in muscle and finish and weight. Some of those small things like structure and balance really come into play for making decisions in tighter pairs. So when we look at the sheep, we're going to evaluate them from three different angles, from the side, from the front and rear, and then from the top and the three dimensions or three sides or three uh, ends we're gonna be looking from. Uh, when we first approach the class and we're looking at it from the side, we can tell a lot about the animal. We can see the overall length of body of the animal. We can see the size and scale. We can look from the, from the you know, comparing one animal to the next, the height from where it stands at the ground to the height of its back line. 
We can see the depth of body. When we're talking about depth of body. The depth from the spine going down to the bottom edge of its belly. What's the depth? Uh, how, how much space is there from that back line to the belly line? We can see that depth of body. We can see those other lines. We can see the lines in the shoulder, how the head and neck are attached to the rest of the animal. Um, we can see the straightness, the length here of the rump of the animal. We can see the lines of the leg. We can see the set to the hock, the set to the pastern, the set to the knee in the front, and, and evaluate whether those lines are at a correct angle. And we can also see some of that dimension of muscling, particularly in the leg. We can see that bulge uh, coming off the backside of the animal of the muscle. And a flatter animal, that's going to be more of a flat angle as opposed to a bulge here looking at the rear side of the leg. So we can see those kind of things when we're evaluating animals from the side. Then we're going to move to the back view. The back view really tells us a lot about the amount of muscle and volume in particular in the animal. It's harder to talk a little bit about the, the pattern uh, and the structural correctness from the rear. There's some things we can evaluate the structural correctness from the rear. But when we're looking from the rear, we're really looking at that amount, volume of muscle and that volume of the animal. We're looking at the width and the thickness and dimension of the animal down its top here across the hip, how wide it is. How wide is it from outside to outside of each leg? How deep is the animal in its twist? So from, uh, from its dock down here to the bottom edge where the two legs come together, the depth in this uh, portion right here through the, what we call the twist of the animal. The further down this goes, the, the more of a U and less of a V this shape is uh, here in the twist of the animal, uh, usually there's a sign of more muscle. We can see the amount of width they stand at the ground. The wider the animal stands at the ground, at its feet here, corresponds usually with the width of the animal up top. An animal that stands wider at the ground is you, most of the time going to be wider at the top edge of that animal because they just physically have a wider body to stretch that muscle across on the top. So we look at the width uh, body here at the bottom. Then we're looking down the top of the animal. The top of the animal, we are seeing kind of two things simultaneously, or three things. We're going to be looking at the muscle, we're going to be looking at the volume, and we're going to be looking for the finish uh, or the fat cover on the animal. We'll look over the top. When we evaluate over the top, I like to start at the front end of the animal, right where the neck starts to come into the shoulder. So we look at the width across the top of the shoulder, how that width carries down through the rack over the loin and then coming back into the hip. Ideally, we want the animal to be fairly similar in width across the top of its shoulder as it is coming into um, the back of, of its dock here, coming into the back of its hip. Animals that really taper, if they're really narrow in the front and taper out wider, um, coming this way, we would like to see them wider. If they're widest of the shoulder and they kind of taper coming back to the hip, that's even more of a problem. When we're talking about volume, we can see this roundness, this arch and spring to the body. An animal that is wider across the top of its rib has more of a curvature to its rib shape is gonna have more volume, as opposed to an animal that is flatter in its rib shape, narrower in this middle section, meaning they have less volume. This also is a way place we can look for condition. And we're gonna look at some pictures here looking at condition in lambs. Uh, but the rounder they are, so the square, when, just like in market hogs, the square, if they're really square up top, there's less fat cover over the top of this muscle tissue. If they are uh, more triangular, so they kind of come to a point, the spine is sticking up as the highest point, the tip of the edge of the spine is the highest point in their body. Um, that means they don't have a lot of muscle. They probably don't have a lot of condition. They definitely don't have as much muscle popping up on the top, coming up to the spine. If they're really round on their top shape, that usually means that they're carrying a lot more fat. As they start to deposit fat up at the top along the edge of the spine, they kind of a rounded look as opposed to a square look over their top. So if we're not, if we're just seeing lambs in a rack or being held and we're not allowed to handle them and we're judging market lambs, one of those places we can really evaluate finishes by looking at the shape of this top. 
if it is very round and they're very rounded out the dock up here, and then we'll talk about looking at the shoulder here in a minute, um, that's a sign that a lamb is carrying a lot of condition and it's probably got too much fat or less desirable amount of fat than we prefer. Looking at the front end of the animal can also tell us some important things. We can also look at that width. Once again, we talk about the width at the rear leg, but looking at the width of the front legs and the space here in the chest floor at the bottom of the breast tells us a lot about that body capacity. You know, the animal is really square and wide open here at the bottom of its, sh at the bottom of its shoulder here at the breast. Um, that means it has a lot of space there in what we call the forerib, the front part of the rib is really big and open, and that's a good thing. That means that most times the animal's gonna be really big and wide up top, so there's more space for it to put muscle on over the top of that rack. There's also more room just for its internal organs. Things like its heart, its lungs, and it also corresponds with the amount of space it has uh, for its, its rumen in there. And that more space means they can eat more, they're typically gonna grow faster and become bigger than one that is tighter and more narrow in this internal organ cavity up here in the front. So one that's big and open. You don't want too open. We're talking about open. We're talking about the width up here. Not talking about the shoulder blade. Sometimes when we look at the front, particularly in use is an important thing to look, is the angle and how this front end comes together. If they're too open uh, up here at the front, the shoulder blade is what's opened up, not the chest floor is opened up. That's more of a structure problem. We'll see that when the animals walk that they are too open in their shoulders. So we want that shoulder blade nice and tight and laid against the uh, rib cage, but we wanna see that width down here in the, that fore rib, which is the ribs that lie underneath the shoulder blade and the size of that area underneath the shoulder blade. This is also another place to look for the finish on a lamb. And we're gonna evaluate that in the front end of the lamb in two different places. Down here in the breast of the lamb, the more uh, square, and angulation there is to the muscle shape. You can actually see the muscle definition down in the breast. The leaner they are, as they get fatter, just like in market steers, this breast here starts to fill with fat. And you get more of a round and bulgy look down here to the breast. The other place, particularly in lambs, is a really good way to evaluate finish. There's a little groove that comes down here at the edge of their neck where it comes into their shoulder. This little groove right here, as the animals start to get fat or fills in, you can't see this groove that runs down the neck of the lamb. So if they're closely shorn and we see a nice groove coming down that lamb, we know it's lean. If that neck is very full and you can't see that groove running down the edge, either edge of the neck, that lamb is putting on, has carrying more condition, that groove is filled in with fat cover. All right, we're going to compare two lambs. Uh, I pulled up two pictures here so we can kind of see some of those things we're looking for. We're talking about being a fat lamb or, or a leaner lamb. We're going to start here with the, with the fat lamb. This lamb is showing a lot of signs of fat. So first of all, we'll look from the side. Uh, we can see this lamb is very big and deep and round in this lower belly here. If this was a U, that might be a good thing, but here in the weather, this is just a lot of waste down in here. We're not, we don't really eat the belly, right? This is not muscle that we eat down here. This is just gonna get thrown away. This is full of a lot of fat down here around the internal organs of pushing it down. Um, okay, it's a little bit hard to see in this picture here, but there's a groove. Here's where the groove is on this lamb's neck, and that is full. This breast of the lamb out here, we can see it's kind of pushed forward. It's very round. Uh, through the chest, not kind of a sharper square angle right here. That's because this breast is full of fat. So this lamb is carrying a lot of fat. We see this very rounded shape up top, right? It's very round. We don't see squareness. We don't see very much muscle definition in the shoulder. It's very smooth, kind of like when we watch, we're looking for um, fat in a market hog. We can look across the top of that blade. Same thing in market lamps. We can look over this blade and see if we can see when they walk, we see more motion uh, up here in the shoulder blade moving. Can we see the little groove up here at the top or the top of the shoulder blade um, comes over to the top, you know, coming up the top of the rib cage here. This is smooth. It's all filled in. If we look at this lamp from behind, particularly around the dock here, it is very full. It looks like, can we talk about which one you think about compared to the judging steers? market steers. Look for those ponds of fat up here at the tail head. 
This one here is the tail head has filled in completely or the dock is filled in completely with fat and we don't see the definition here in the dock uh, like we will in a leaner lamb. And this being a weather, we can start to see fat down here in the cod, the cod area right here is where it was castrated. Uh, we start to see fat deposits down here in the bottom of the cod. Um, a leaner lamb, we will not see this. So this lamb here is definitely what we consider over-conditioned. It is too far uh, beyond what we prefer for fat cover. So we're going to go the other way, a lamb that's really not carrying enough condition. So we can compare and contrast these two pictures, right? Uh, this lamb here is very lean. It needs some more time on feed. way we know that, we can look at the difference in the belly line to start with. This lamb really comes up in the rear flank. He's really tight and lean here in his lower one third of his rib and belly. Uh, we look over here at the shoulder. We see sharpness. We see angles. This area we talk about right here in the neck. And once again, it's a dark lamb. And it, if you look more in the front, you can see, but it's right here. There's a groove that comes down his shoulder. And that groove is very prominent right here in his neck. He's very sharp over the top of his shoulder. We can see. The top of the shoulder blade, we can see more of a peak up here in the top of his shoulder. He, we can see more angulation and less smoothness over his shoulder. It doesn't look round and bold over his shoulder here. He's got some less muscle than that lamb we're looking at previously, but a lot of that we saw in another lamb was fat cover over the top of this muscle. This one here, um, we're looking at, uh, we're actually seeing the bone and the muscle under there. Looking over his dock, this is really in particular where you see this lamb. Um, is really lean. We can see this dock here is very sharp. We see this indentation here uh, as where the dock is coming down to the leg. Look at it from this angle, we can see this sharpness coming into the dock here. There's not any fat cover put over the top of this portion of his, at the end of his spine here. So this lamb is very lean. We don't see any fat in the cod tissue here. So this little lamb is quite the opposite of the last lamb. Both these lambs have problems. The other lamb we looked at was overconditioned. This is a lamb that's too green. He needs more time on feed. We would like to see more condition on this lamb for him to be at an optimal market finish. All right, so we're gonna move on just a little bit here. So when we judge a class of market lambs, a lot of times they may be tied uh, to a fence. They may be in a rack, held in a rack or they may be exhibited and held by an exhibitor, but they may not have a number on them. When you walk into a class of market lambs and they are stationary and they don't have a number on them, when you're standing behind the class, looking from left to right, that's how you're always gonna number the class. Number one is always on the left. Number four is always the farthest on the right. This is one of the few classes. Most every other class we're gonna look at most time they're going to be numbered. If lambs are in a rack, they may not be numbered. So when you walk up to the class, if you're standing behind them, one is on the far left, four is always going to the far right. So it's one, two, three, four going left to right, looking from the rear of the class. As we approach the animals here, um, we want to start to see the difference. And one of the keys for judging market lambs and really all livestock is not to get too close. You can actually see more by being further back than you can be from being right up on top of the animal, especially when you're wanting to compare them to each other. So when we look at this class of lambs here, there's some things that stand out very, very quickly here when we look at them, right? We talked about looking at base width, how wide they stand at the ground. We can see some differences here in width of their, between their feet as they stand the ground. We can see differences up here in width over the top of their hip. As we look at it here, we can see some differences in their rib shape, how round they are on their rib shape. We can see differences in how wide they are here right behind their shoulder. Um, and we can see some differences at the, at the dock. Well, these are not sheared particularly close. They're so short enough, we can kind of see some differences here in the dock, the amount of fat over the dock of these lambs that we're looking at it from the rear. So we can start to look and make some, and analyze these and start to see some of those differences. When we're looking at them from here, the key things to look for, width at the ground, width through the center portion of the leg, from edge to edge. Who is widest from here to this edge of the leg, 
or who is the narrowest or the flattest from this edge of the leg to this edge of the leg. Also, the other thing we'll look at is are they, where is the widest point? When we look at it from there, where is the widest point? We want that widest point to be at the center portion of the leg. If the widest point is up here at the top of the animal, they could be getting quite a bit, they're getting fat and or they're just really flat muscled and narrow based. They tend to be narrow, so they want to taper as they go down and lower to the ground. So we're gonna look at that width at the ground, width at the midpoint of the leg, and the width over the top of the hip across the dock here. So those are places we want to start to evaluate the width of the animal. Um, then we can also, sometimes within a rack, it can be harder to see that side view. We're going to walk and move. So you kind of look at the three quarter angle, you kind of start to see that side, walk around front, look at those front legs. Um, but some of the, and you want to start to make decisions. But then when most time in market classes, if you're allowed to handle them, you're going to use that handle time to handle that lamb to kind of back up and confirm what you saw with your eyes. So I'm going to pull up a handling video here real quick and walk through how to properly handle a market lamb uh, when you walk up to them. So let me see here. Close this one down. And share my other screen. Oops, wrong one. That's not what I want to do. When we handle a market lamb, we want to do it the same for every lamb we'll handle. When we come in, we'll come in from behind them. We'll take our hands, we're starting right here behind the shoulder. We want to feel the width, the thickness, the fullness of the loin muscle over the top of the rack. So right here behind the shoulder blades, I feel my fingers. I can feel it right here behind shoulder blade. Then we'll take my hands and we'll feel that going progressively down to the last rib. When I reach the last rib, I'm going to take both hands, put my fingertips in at the last rib, and measure the loin going back to the hip. We can do it this way. We can do it this way to feel the thickness. If you have smaller hands, you're probably going to use your fingers. See the length and the thickness of that loin. So we're going to push in. Don't get down here. I see I go down here. Pushing, this does nothing down here on the belly. You want to be on the muscle. Fingertips pushed in here to the edge of the last rib, coming back all the way to the hip. To find the width, the length, and the depth of that loin. We may also feel for condition. We're going to use this portion right here, the central portion of the ribs. We're going to gently use our fingers and push against the ribs and rub back and forth. Maybe down just a little bit lower, closer to uh, the elbow down here. And we just want to feel the magnitude, how it feels like over the ribs, right? We want it to feel like the back of our hand. If it feels like this, too thin. If it feels like this, too fat. We want it to feel like the back of our hand. And then we're going to handle the leg. This is kind of an optional thing to handle the leg. Some people don't do that. You want to just use a visual. If you're going to handle the leg, you're going to use your hands. Come in on the leg. Come back behind the leg. Make your fingers touch. And then use your thumb around the front and measure the distance. Uh, between your thumbs to figure your, your leg, which you always want your fingers touching in the back. And the most important way to handle lamb is to feel down the top, the loin, and the condition on a market lamb. Then we're going to do the same move when we come into the next one, right? Come in here, find the back of the shoulder, come down the top. As we're coming down the top, we're feeling the width of this loin muscle over the top of the rib cage. There's some major difference. You feel the squareness, the fullness, and the thickness of that muscle coming right down here and over the top of the ribs. Find that last rib, measure the loin, width, feel the condition, come down, measure the leg. Next one, come in here on top. Feel that loin. We can also feel condition. When we feel it on the top, we can also feel the condition of the lamb some amount. Uh, the freshness of that lamb. We feel how much that spine, uh, top of the spine, sticks above the muscle tissue. 
Um, so we can feel some differences in these limbs. We can put our fingers in here, feeling how far apart above the, uh, the muscle tissue that spine sticks, the fatter the lamb, the more muscle the lamb has, the less you're gonna be able to feel that spine sticking up above. So we come down the top, find that last rib, measure our loin, feel the condition over the ribs, measure the leg. And then finally for our last lamp, same thing. Find the top of the shoulder, find that rack, use our hands to come down that top, feel that spine in there, find that last rib, measure, 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 right? So when I handle these limbs, so we're using the handling to confirm what we see with our eyes. That's what we're really doing. We're reconfirming re what we feel with our eyes on this lamb. When we handle this lamb, this lamb here handles with the widest top, from her top of her rack all the way to her loin. She has the biggest top in all these lambs we handled. Whereas this lamb here has the smallest top and has the least amount of condition. She's the uh, least fresh. We can feel. Um, more of that spine sticking up on this lamb right here down her top as compared to everybody else in the class. So we have our biggest loin right here and our smallest loin. If we look at it visually, we can kind of see that, how much bigger this you is over here over her top coming back into her hip here, how much wider she is. Um, that translates to what you feel when you handle them. All right. We're gonna move on to uh, breeding ewes here in just a second. Let me let me make us make a stop here and see if anyone has questions about judging market lambs. Um, we're gonna recover some of the ground we just covered a little bit um, as we go into ewes. So some of those things carry over. We're talking about particularly we're gonna talk about volume and structure uh, quite a bit here as we move into breeding ewes. But does anyone have any uh, any questions? Uh, before we move into the breeding you section about evaluating a market lamp. So you can turn on your uh, audio if you want to ask a question or you can put it in the chat box either way. Okay. If not, we will move on uh to our to our breeding use so when we evaluate breeding use our priorities of what's most important changes for market lambs i think this is a, a pro area where people young people who are just starting to get into livestock judging sometimes um, can get tripped up they can tend to want to judge a breeding you as you would a market lamb. And that can sometimes really trip you up because if you're not paying enough attention to the structure of the animal, which is the most important thing when we're looking for breeding sheep um, and also for our weather dam class, this is the structural correctness of the females. Um, that's at the top of the of the, uh, the list here. Whereas in the market lambs, that's one of the lower prior lowest priorities is what the structure of the animal is. And that can really chip them up. So it's very important when we judge the class to change our mindset when we go to evaluate a breeding ewe class to really look at that structure. And we're going to talk about where to look for those angles and look at that structure here in just a second. 
That's followed by volume and capacity. So let's say, so why is structure important? The structure, just like muscle was the most important part of market lens, so we eat the lamb, we're eating that muscle tissue, we need, we want, we prefer more of it than less of it. The structure is most important in a breeding ewe because we want that ewe to remain in the flock for a long period of time to produce as many lambs as possible. When they have structural problems, that results in them in several things either getting arthritis as they get older, therefore they don't walk as well, um, they get uncomfortable, they start losing body condition, they don't rebreed, they don't milk as much because they're not grazing, because their feet hurt, their legs hurt, they don't hold up, and they have to cull them sooner. Um, if you have to, you know, comparing having to sell you at five years old because she has structural problems and she is now uncomfortable, um, she can't keep her weight. She can't carry a pregnancy when she's carrying twins. Uh, she's laying down all the time because her feet, her uh, hocks, her hip hurts. Um, and so she loses weight. She doesn't milk as well. She grazes small lambs. Having to cull her at five for that reason, as opposed to culling her at 10 years of age for that reason, is a huge impact on the bottom line. It takes three cycles, and it takes three years of lambing most of the time for that ewe to finally pay back what it took to grow her uh, to a year of age. Um, after three or three lambings, the rest of that is profit. Up until three lambings, less of that is profit. If she, you know, if she doesn't lamb till she's two, three, you just, and you have to call her at five, you've just broken even. If you can hold her another five years, you start making money. So that's why structure is so important to understand why structure is so important because you want longevity in these animals. And that goes with volume and capacity too. Volume and capacity affects the profitability and the longevity of the animal in two different ways. The first one is the so amount of space there is in the animal for the rumen to sit. Animals that are tight, they don't have as much volume or capacity, have less room for the rumen to sit inside. They can eat less volume of grass. Um, therefore, they are going to, in general, as compared to something that has more volume, be thinner and give less milk because they're getting less energy into their body. The second one, and probably almost more importantly, is the volume and capacity is directly related to the ability for that you to hold her lambs during pregnancy. Um, a you that has low volume is gonna have more problems. It'd be harder for her to carry a set of twins. They're gonna be born smaller because they have less room to grow. Um, smaller lambs tend to have, uh, be more fragile and are more likely to lose them in the first couple of days of life. If she has a set of twins and she does not have as much volume, those lambs start to push further onto her rumen capacity. She can eat less. She's going to be thinner when she has those lambs. Therefore, she is going to milk less. Those lambs are going to grow less. So this is why these two things, structure and volume capacity, are the most or the important traits because they directly affect how long that you can remain in the flock and how good of a lamb or lambs that she will continue to raise, that you want her to raise every year for multiple years in a row. That's why we put emphasis on structure and volume and capacity. Um, so the next two are femininity and muscle. Uh, in breeding, if, if the term says breeding ewes in the class title, we're gonna put some more emphasis on femininity than muscle. Muscle kind of falls to the bottom. We want some, but that it's not as most important. We can bring muscle into the offspring through the rams that we breed them to. If it says weather dams, then we're gonna put more emphasis on muscle because we really are putting that emphasis. We're not, those females are probably not gonna be much emphasis for them to produce female, more females for the future. They're kind of what we call a terminal female but they're aimed at not producing replacement females for further flocks, but their emphasis is on producing weathers and rams that are heavier muscled, um, either to go into the show ring or to make rams 
to breed to other ewes. So we're putting more emphasis on the muscle. If it says weather dams, we're going to put more emphasis on the muscling of that animal than in the femininity. The femininity side, femininity is a combination of traits that means they look more female than male. That's looking at their head shape. That is looking at um, their body shape. We're going to talk about the maternal wedge. Um, that's looking at uh, femininity also corresponds with um, utter volume, teeth size, uh, also go into that. How well is she going to be as a female? Does she look like a female as opposed to a male? Femininity and muscling's work against each other a little bit, or a fair amount, I should say. It's hard for a very muscle-bound lamb to look very feminine. They're always going to look more masculine. Their neck is going to be thicker around. Um, their head is typically going to be wider. Um, they're just not going to have a more angular shape to their body. So that's the difference between femininity and muscle. And what emphasis we put on that determined is by the class name. If it says breeding use, femininity is important because we want them to look like females because that is corresponds to the likelihood of them being good breeding females and produce future ewe lambs that are going to be good productive females. If we have it on weather dams, we're going to put more emphasis on that muscling um, the muscle traits uh, as opposed to femininity. So those are those two change depending on the title of the class. So when we're looking at the structure of the animal, we're going to start at the ground and we're going to look at the angles at the leg and the knees and the shoulders. Um, we can see that while the animal is standing still, and we can evaluate that even better when the animal's on the move. And I'm gonna show a video here at the end of, of some of these ewe lambs walking back and forth and what we're gonna look for. But we're looking at the angle of the pastern, which is the joint at the top of the hoof, below the dew claw. We want that to be fairly upright and straight. Problems start to happen when we get too weak in the pasture. We get more angle in this joint. In young sheep, particularly, you know, we don't see as many problems. We can, we, we, they seem to walk okay with weaker pasterns when they're young. But when we put that ewe, we make her 200 pounds and heavy bread with big lambs inside of her. These pasterns really start to hurt her. She's putting more stress on the joints. And over the years, she starts to get arthritis in these joints and they get very painful and she doesn't want to walk. She wants to sit down because her pasterns hurt so bad uh, for her to walk around. So weak pasterns shorten the longevity of that you being able to remain in the herd because they get arthritis in this joint because the angle here pulls too much on that tendon. The bones start to grind in each other and they have pain as they get older, and particularly when they're pregnant. Uh, calf need is not as much of a problem in sheep. We'll see that it's more in goats. We can see buck knee. That's when the, the angle here, the front leg, they are over on the knee. The knee is out here with the toe and not behind the toe. We want to see the, the front of the knee should line with the front of the pastern, not with the outside edge of the toe. Buck knee, the front edge of the knee is going to line over the top of uh, the 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 hoof here, the tip of the hoof. Once again, this puts extra pressure, not only on the knee, but also puts extra pressure on the pastor in these ewes will get more uncomfortable when they're heavily bred and as they get older. Back leg structure affects how well the animal walks. Uh, we have two things, correct? We're gonna look kind of an angle. We're gonna see a straight angle from the back of the uh, back of the bone here going up from the hock to the pastern is going to be straight and carrying straight up to the back of the edge of the animal. Um, the two things we'll look for here are sickle hocked and post legged. Sickle hocked, where they have too much angle or too much set in the hock, is much more acceptable in an animal than being post legged. When they're post legged, they're too straight. This results in a lot more pain. Being a little bit too much set to the, to the hock, in general, 
does not result in as much long-term uh, damage to the to the uh, to the joints as we see in animals that are post leg. This can sometimes cause problems. They may want to go down if you got a big ram trying to breed. They can sometimes get down or get pushed down. Post legged though, what happens? They're too straight. There's not enough padding in between these joints, and the up and down motion and a pounding as they walk causes these joints to become stiff. Animals that are post-legged are short-strided. When we walk, watch them walk, a correct uh, structured sheep, or really any constructionally correct uh, animal, uh, four-legged animal, we're talking about cattle, hogs, goats, this works for all of them. When they walk, the back foot should basically step in the hole that the front foot left. An animal that is sick, sickle hawk, will step up underneath themselves and kind of step over um, the hole they left. The easy way, easier way to admit, sometimes notice sickle hawk is they tend to roach their top and drop their hip because this angle here, they step up underneath themselves, they'll roach their top, so they'll get a little arch in the top of their back when they walk, and their hip will kind of drop down. That's a very common sign to look for. If you see the animal kind of pop its top up and drop its hip down as it walks, most likely she is sickle hawked. An animal that is post-legged tends to look even more uncomfortable when they walk. They tend to be shorter strided. They act, walk a little choppy. The front, the, the leg does not the hold, the back leg comes up to as short of the front leg. And you'll see that they act like they're stiff they're stiff in their hip. They kind of usually tend to be shorter. There's some things that come with post-legged. Being shorter in the hip um, tends to come with being post-legged. Being long and steep in the hip comes with sickle hocked, whereas coming short in the hip tends to come with being post-legged. Those things kind of come together. Um, they both uh, correspond with each other. But an animal that is post-legged will be restricted. As you watch her walk, it'll be a little choppy. It won't be as fluid you will, this leg will move faster and a shorter, kind of a shorty chop walk as they walk around as opposed to being a longer, smoother stride that you'll see in a correct animal. And really the best way to see post-legged and sickle hocked is to watch them walk. Um, pastern, weak pasterns and buck knees, uh, you can see in an animal standing still. It's harder sometimes to see sickle hocked and post-legged an animal that's stationary. They really show that when they're on the move. All right, we're going to talk a little bit about volume and capacity also now before we move to our, our walking video. When we're talking about volume and capacity, one of the, you know, the two best ways to evaluate this is from starting off from the side. We can see a lot about the volume and capacity of an animal by just looking at the side. The depth, as I said, from the top of the spine to the bottom of the belly, the width there is in this area. A more shallow animal is gonna be less, a deeper animal is gonna be more, and you're gonna see more of a rounded edge down here at the bottom of the belly for a really deep-sided animal. If they're more straight, it's more of a straight line, and particularly if the deepest, deeper part is at the chest floor, Going up into the rear flank is kind of more of a taper up than a taper down or a taper back. That is means there's less volume. When we're talking about the maternal wedge. We're looking for an animal that gets progressively, they're going on a straight top line, but gets progressively deeper from the chest floor going back towards the rear flank. That is more ideal. The line we do not want to see is when they go from the chest floor going up into the rear flank. That's a sign of an animal that does not have a lot of depth of body. Then we look at them over the top or from their rear. We want to see this roundness and arch to the rib shape. If they are flatter in the rib shape, so we can really see in these two pictures the difference in the shape of the rib here, right? It comes out from the spine, it comes out wide before it curves down, but down here in the middle portion, it's still got a lot of curve to it. Whereas this lamb here, she comes out from her spine with some curve, but then it kind of plunges, boom, straight down the side. So she's really more flat sided. This is less volume and capacity. You want to see that big round 
rib shape. Also, we're going to look at different parts of the rib for that capacity. When we talked about the maternal wedge. We said we wanted to get wider or deeper when looking at it from the side, going from the chest floor back to the rear flank. Maternal wedge also means going from the front of the shoulder, coming back to the hip, that they get progressively wider. So if we look at this view over here on the left, from her shoulder coming back to her hip, she gets progressively wider as she comes back. In fact, her widest portion right here might actually be the center portion of her rib, but that's competing with the front edge of her hip here, being which is the widest. But she gets on her top line, she gets from here to there, she is progressively wider. In fact, let me show this with a pencil real quick here. What I'm trying to show here, pen. From this point right here, coming back to her hip, she comes and oops, not doing a very straight line here. But she opens up as she comes back into her hip. Whereas this shoe does not open up as much. She's more straighter. She's not as tapered in her shape from her shoulder. She's just about as just as wide here at her shoulder as she is here at the back edge of her loin. There's not as much difference in the amount of width from here to there. So she is flatter in her shape. She's not as angular, we call angular in her design, as this, this U is over here. All right, so when we're talking, we're moving back to volume capacity. I want you all to look at this class and put in the comment box for me, um, which one of these U's do you think has the least depth of body? Which one of these is showing the least maternal wedge from her chest floor going back to her rear flank? Which one that tapers upward instead of going down? All right, looks like most of you found it. Yes, female number four here tapers upwards in her rear in her in her bottom in her midline right she does not have that depth of body look at number three which will actually the next question i can ask you know which is the deepest side which i want deepest side right from her top of her spine to the bottom of her belly has this deep sweep she drops from her chest floor going back to her midpoint to her belly button here um from to her navel from her chest floor to her navel she drops down in her rib shape. This is the most uh, more ideal female rib shape that we would like to see. These use here, number one and number two, they have these, and they're more level. They have some drop, particularly one drops a little bit more going back to her navel than two does. Two, look at her, she's a little bit more what we call flatter. Even this one here, we're looking from the side, we can see that rib shape, right? We can see the bulge in the rib here in one right here in this back section as opposed to two. Two is flatter, we can tell even just from the rear here that two is flatter in her rib shape than one is. One's got more roundness through her rib shape. But the one that has the most volume and capacity, right, which comes in three dimensions, right, we're talking about volume and capacity, the depth, the width, and the length. Three's not the longest, I give that to two. Two's the longest body. But three is by far the deepest. And I think if we got behind her, I don't have a picture from behind, but if we got behind her, I have a feeling that she is also the widest you in the class. And she's not that much shorter than two, making her by far the highest volume you in this class, right? Um, something else we can look at is the shape of the shoulder. When we're talking about feminine, we want to look at how the neck and shoulder and the shoulder blade lay in on these U's. And this one, it's a little bit harder, but when we look at, we're looking at the angle here at the back of the neck coming into uh, the top of the shoulder. I, I really like one, so one, if I look at one here, I really want to talk about, she is very straight in her top, she's very level at her hip. It carries all the way up to the point of her shoulder. That's almost a straight, that's a very straight line there. And it makes this nice, sharp 90 degree angle, boop, going straight up. She comes out of the top of her shoulder really nice in her neck, right? Um, 
Whereas we look at number four here, she starts to taper a little bit more in her hip. She's got more of that little slope right there. Uh, number three, she's not as good. So number three is not as good in her shoulder coming into her neck as one, right? We're never going to find, that's always uh, the truth. We're never going to find the perfect animal. They're always going to be false. So while three is the biggest volume, she's not as good in her shoulder and her neck, the way this all blends together here up front as one is. So we look at the front end of one, looking at the breast, how she really comes up nice and straight um, up here in the front, coming out of the breast, going up to her jaw. Whereas three wants to extend out a little bit more, get more of this rounded shape. If she were to stand naturally, she's gonna hold her head more of a little bit of angle. She's gonna have a little bit what we call more of a U neck, right here at her neck and shoulder junction. She's not as straight and angular uh, in, her, in her shoulder and in her neck junction as one is. So that's something we know. We got two, two U's here that are really good quality U's. We got one, we say it's a higher volume U. We got one that's a little bit more feminine and extended and correct in her neck and shoulder angles. Um, so those are some things we look at when we're looking at the side of an animal is how this shoulder and neck kind of come together. And that comes in femininity. While this angulation and sweep to the rib is feminine, the shoulder and neck junction up in here and the length of neck and how the shoulder lays back onto her rib cage is also a sign of femininity. Um, we want to see this, this angulation or this angle of the shoulder right here. Oops, I don't want to grab the pen here. Yep. This angle to her shoulder like that. That's what we want to see. Whereas this one uh, right here, she's getting kind of flat, more flat in her angle of her shoulder. We like to see more slope to it. This one here's got really good slope, but she's a little more open because the, if we look at it from the front, she's this point of her shoulder, which is right here, is more open than this one here it lays in a little tighter. So we're kind of looking at the shape of the shoulder and neck up here, okay? All right. All right. So going back to our, our little group of ewes here we've been looking at. We, once again, looking at them from a breeding ewe standpoint, there are still things we're going to look at that muscle, but also that hip. The hip shape and width is very important when we're judging breeding ewes because they have to lamb. Those lambs have to come through this hip to come out into the world, right? So what we're looking for here in our hip shape is the squareness of our hip, right? We have our, there we go, our hooks are up here, which is the front of the pelvis, and then the pins are back here. And this one here, this girl here, her pin bones are here and her hooks are right here. And then we mark it here, hooks here, pin bone is here and here. And this one here, she's here there and there and there. So we look at them, we want them to be really wide at the back edge of these pin bones, right? The back of her hip, because that's where the lamb has to come out at. Use it will start to taper more from hooks to pins, get shorter in their hips. So if they get kind of shorter in their hip or more tapered or angular in this hip shape, they can have more issues of having lambs than ones that are wider, particularly at the pin, we call about the pin set, at the back end of the animal. If they are wider at the pin set, that's a good thing. One of the indicators for how wide they're at the pin set is how wide and square they stand at the ground here. This you here in the middle, if we look, she stands very square. Her hocks right here, are pointed straight back. This U here, she is pointed just a tick in. If they are pointed, they're hocks, so she's a little bit what we call cow hocked. She's not bad, but she is a little bit cow hocked. And when the hocks start pointing in towards each other, that means that the hip is, is, pointing, is pulled in closer to the pins. The hooks are wider than the pins. If they stand squarer, they are more square up here in the top of their hip. 
So that's one way to evaluate the hip shape is by looking at how they stand at the ground. Or if you want to see if they're cow hocked, um, if they are tapered into their pin from hooks to pins, more than likely they're also going to be standing a little bit cow hocked off their rear legs uh, or have more angular point, those hocks will be pointing in. And that has to do with how they're shaped up here in the top of their hip. And use that are just narrower and smaller in the top of their hip are going to stand narrower and closer together at the ground. Those two things correspond with each other. So when we're looking at replacement fields, that's why we want to see animals that stand wide at the ground. Because if they're standing wide at the ground, that means they are wide up here in the top of their, in, wide in their hip. So they're going to be able to lamb easier. So if they stand narrower at the ground, they're going to be narrower in their hip and they're going to have more lambing problems. Okay. All right, I'm gonna pull a video. We're just about done here for today. And I'm gonna pull up this video and we're gonna watch it a little bit. I tried to shoot and some parts of it are good. Some of them are kind of running a little faster than I want. But the easiest and the best way to evaluate a breeding ewe is to watch them on the walk. You can see some things when they're on the stop, but you can really see those same things and more when you watch them as, they, um, as they're walking. And we're going to pull up our other video here. Oops, went the wrong way. Okay, we're going to watch this a little bit. And it's kind of a long video. It's about seven minutes long, it looks like here. And I may stop it a part of the way through. But I want you all just to watch. I have now have the use number. I put numbers on their back. Just to watch them walk, watch the angles of their hip, watch the angles that they how they step underneath themselves with their legs when they stop. Look at their width, how when they naturally stand, uh, the width that they stand at the ground, the angle that they sit with their hold their head uh, as it corresponds with the top of their shoulder and their back and at the front of their breast. How those angles come together, um, and see if you can sort of spot some of the differences.
So some of the things I want you to notice as you watch these ewes walk. Um, the U that stands the widest of the ground of all of these U's and has what we call the biggest foot, so that's the diameter of her bone, is number four. Um, this is a U that by, in this class we call her the biggest bone uh, and widest base U in the class. And that is going to correspond with the amount of muscle she has. If they are big bone, they stand wide of the ground in general, they're going to have more muscle. She, this is when we were handling video, this is number four again. She was the widest over the top of her rack and carried out the widest through her loin into her hips. So she's the heaviest muscled you in the class. I really like this you when she, the way she holds her head up. She's very up headed. The angle is very good as it comes into the top of her shoulder. Um, and she's one of the widest hip views in the class. The other really good you in this class is number two here, which is, um, I would call her the all white you, or she's the bald headed you. She doesn't have as much of a wolf cap or wool on her legs as the other one, but she is really big through the center portion of her leg. She stands very wide at the ground. She's a little finer bone. The diameter of her bone at the cannon and in her rear leg there is not as big. She also wants to get a little bit more structurally incorrect as you watch her walk. She will roach her top. So her top kind of pops up here in the middle just a little bit when she walks. She wants to get up underneath herself just a little bit. She stands sometimes. You'll see her. She kind of roaches that or arches that top line a little bit um, when she stands naturally. Now, if someone were to hold her head up and uh, actually pose her, she looks really good. You can hardly see that. But in her natural walk, she's just a little bit off. And she doesn't come up as nice right here at her shoulder and neck. She's got a little bit more of a U-neck when she, she pops up. She does not as smooth and as neat right here at the back of her neck and her shoulder right there. She's a little bit more open in her shoulder up here in the front um, than, than the, say, the 4U is. So she just got structurally, she's not quite as good. But she's really big and round ribbed. Um, she's very big hipped. She's heavy muscle. This is a really good U. She's just not quite as correct as four is. Then we have two U's that have got some more pro so a few more problems. Uh, the one U, which is the speckle-faced U. She's the one that has the dark speckle-faced U. She's really wide. She gets a little bit more off in her hip. If you look, you see her hip protrudes more. It doesn't fit as blend in as smoothly to her body as these other as, uh, two and four do. They kind of see it pops out a little bit more. It's really wide, but it's a little bit shorter. And um, when you watch her walk, she tends to get up underneath. She's actually just a little bit sickle hot. So she got more angle than you prefer in her back leg. She stands up, she gets up underneath herself a little bit when she walks. And they mostly see that when she drops her hip when she walks. She's got a lot of, when she walks, she gets the most slope to her hip. She's still a very big ribbed you. I think she's got plenty of width. But just structurally, she is not as good as the four and the two U. The three U is the, is the U that's got the, the most problems in this class. And mostly it's in the volume. She is by far the shallowest and the flattest you in the class. She stands the narrowest of the ground as you watch her come towards you. As she stands there, she stands with her feet closest together. She also tends to be a little bit more pinched into her hip here. She's smaller in her hip, pinches into those pins a little bit more. She just gets outclassed from a volume and, and productivity standpoint. She's got the least amount of maternal wedge that we have in the class. She's the lightest muscle and just the narrowest in her chest floor, the shallowest in her body um, of, of those lambs. So I, when I was evaluating those U's, there's, there's a U when I walk in, I find there's a U, the first move in that class was to find the number th uh, three U and put her at the bottom. That was the most logical thing. She's the one that has the least quality and the one that kind of moves that way pretty quick. I think you need to find when you evaluate this class, the two and the four use. Those are the good use. And I think you could talk those back and forth a little bit. I think there, I mean, there's some different, there's more muscle, I think in two in her leg. She's really bold out of her hip. Structurally, she's just a little bit more off. She's got plenty of rib. 
um, plenty of depth of body. I just like the angles a little bit more. I like the width and the bone a little bit more on four, but that's a close pair of views. And that is a pair of views. They are by far better quality than the other two, which then puts the number one U, or sorry, the, yeah, the number one U kind of in third place. That's just where she logically fits. She's not as good as two and four. She's a, better than three. She logically comes in the third hole. So that's, that's a key when evaluating sheep is this kind of, or any class of livestock, is to break it down into the easiest decisions you can. Find, sometimes it might be a top animal. It might be a bottom animal. It might be a pair of animals that go in the top or the bottom. But make that easy decision, find that easy thing to do, and then kind of start to worry and really closely evaluate the closer animals. In this class, you find the three, get her to the bottom. One rolls there pretty easy. And these are the two U's, the two and the fours, where you should spend most of your time evaluating the differences in those two animals because they're the ones that are most closely, are, are the hardest decision in the class in deciding which factors you want to put emphasis on, okay? And that is what I have for you today. If anybody has any questions, I'll be glad to answer any questions right now. Uh, you can turn your microphone on and ask them, or you can type them in the box. Any questions? If not, I appreciate it. I hope everyone learned something today. And I hope you stick with livestock judging and that we will see you in August at the state judging contest. Y'all have a great day.